Uh, welcome to the forum, and thank you for spending the, this Friday afternoon with us. Uh, I am Taku Suzuki, uh, a Denison faculty member in International Studies program, and along with Dr. Joanna Grabski, right there, <laughs> uh, co-organizer of this forum. Uh, before introducing Dr. Weinberg, uh, uh, Denison president, for his welcoming remark, I want to thank the sponsors and people who made this event possible. Uh, Great Lakes Colleges Association, whose uh, Global Crossroads Grand Challenge Initiative generously supported not only this forum, but also uh, the course collaboration between my course at Denison and the Dr. Brian Miller's course at Allegheny College. That, uh, who are, where are the Allegheny students? Oh, there you go. Welcome. <laughs> Welcome to Denison. And um, um, I want to also thank that Dr. Eric Boynton of Allegheny and Dr. Joanna Grabsky of Denison for their tireless, and I mean tireless, work, effort to make this project happen. I also want to thank Denison's Alford Center for Service Learning uh, and its director, uh, Dr. Gina Dow. The center's pedagogical practice, service, and experiential learning project grant supported this event, as well as my students' experiential learning project at Somali and Bhutanese Nepali community organizations in Columbus. Uh, finally, International Studies Program and Information Technology Services offered many logistical support for this uh, forum. Uh, let me briefly, uh, those who don't have, haven't picked it up, uh, at the entrance there's a small program uh, available, so if you want to uh, pick it up, please do. Uh, there are two 15 minutes long panels for this forum. The first panel is entitled Central Ohio's Refugee Communities and Education. Past, Present, and Future, moderated by uh, Dr. Binaya Sbedi of the Ohio State University. After a very short break, uh, there will be a panel called Rewards and Challenges for First-Generation Refugee and Immigrant Students in Higher Education, uh, moderated by yours truly. Uh, the panelists and the company, as well as the guests from Allegheny and Kenyan Colleges are all invited to the dinner at the President's Dining Room in Hoffman Hall after the second session, so please keep that in mind. Um, this was not the plan, but after this Tuesday's election, in my view, the theme of this forum, the building a strong and lasting relationship between immigrant refugee youth and higher education institution has become as urgent as ever. Given the political climate for immigrants and refugees today uh, in central Ohio and across the nation, my hope is that uh, this forum, with its diverse perspectives from different positions in education, uh, community leaders, students, parents, teachers, or combination of those, uh, will offer us a great opportunity to explore how our universities can connect with diverse communities surrounding us, and to think critically and creatively about the role that universities can play within the greater social fabric. Now, please welcome the president of Denison University, Dr. Adam Weinberg. Thank you. Um, so we, we have students here from, from Kenyan and Allegheny, is that right? Oh, good. It's always so nice to have students from Kenyan here when we're not throwing balls at each other or swinging <laughs> sticks at each other and instead engaging in intellectual discourse. Do we have Allegheny students here as well? Or yeah, good. Welcome as well. So I was asked to talk just for a, a few minutes this morning um, about my views of what the global means in higher education. And prior to coming to, to Denison, um, I spent eight years running an organization called World Learning that some of you may know as SIT, the School for International Training, or the Experiment in International Living. We do a lot, did a lot of work trying to kind of think about how we give um, young people around the world the kinds of cross-cultural experiences they need to become the kinds of human beings the world so desperately needs. Um, and, and so I thought I would just kind of, I'm going to just kind of touch on a bunch of different topics. I'm going to do them fairly superficially, um, but I want to kind of end with kind of a, a, a plea of how I think Denison, Kenyon, and Allegheny can kind of get this right and perhaps lead the way in, in the liberal arts. Um, first and foremost, I think if we're going to really embrace the topic of this conference, um, we have to get study abroad right. On the one hand, it's great that 50% of the students on our campuses study abroad, but, but I worry that too much of what study abroad has become in this country isn't really study abroad. 
Um, students may be going to other countries, but they're not necessarily getting deeply immersed in those countries. I, mean, I believe more students who study abroad from our colleges um, need to be in challenging places, places that really get you outside your comfort zone. Um, I believe that we need to be sending students on programs that have homestays, where students have the opportunity to live in a house with people who do not speak any English and see the world in very different ways, and live in the world in very different ways. Um, so one is just the study abroad, and, and how do we begin to kind of reimagine the study abroad experience um, in slightly bigger, deeper, um, more challenging ways, and then when students come back to campus, to create space for students to bring those voices and views. I, I run across lots of juniors and seniors who tell me the same story. I came back from an SIT program in Nepal or Ghana or wherever I was, and my friends would ask me, how was study abroad? And they would give me about 15 seconds before they were on to their next topic. So that's one big, big theme topic for me that we're beginning to kind of think about at Denison. But the second and perhaps more important is I think we need to move beyond study abroad. The very fact that a college has 50% of its students or 60% studying abroad for half of their junior year does not make the college globally aware or the, or the academic experience globally rich. And so I'll just mention a few things. Um, one is I think we need to do a better job on all of our campuses um, recruiting more students who bring more diverse experiences. And while international students play a huge role in making that happen, we shouldn't forget about the um, the refugees, the migrants, and the others who, who just who live in our own communities. So I'll brag about Denison for a second. Um, as of next year, we will be working with an organization called I Know I Can to fully scholarship 20 students a year to come to Denison. That means at any given point, there'll be 80 students on our campus from the Columbus Public City School System. Um, we're really, really excited about the partnership, and I say this while I look at you, um, I hope we will wind up with more young people from our, from our refugee communities in Columbus. Um, we are very, very fortunate to be 30 miles from an incredibly interesting, diverse city that we have not done a very good job of welcoming to our campus or making the college financially affordable. And then once students come, we need to make sure that we're actually leveraging that. Um, I, I went to Bowdoin in the, in the mid-80s. Um, liberal arts colleges in the mid-80s were many things. They were not diverse places. Kenyon, Allegheny, Denison, across the GLCA, we have a right to feel proud that our campuses have become more diverse, but we, I think, also have to be honest with ourselves about whether diversity's truly become part of our community's culture, right? Do we truly have residential halls where students are arriving their first day and actively seeking out people in their residential halls whose life experiences are most different from their own and making an effort to become friends, right? Are students pushing themselves as they walk around campus to make sure that they're not walking with, sitting with, spending time on Friday and Saturday night with, and joining co-curricular organizations with people whose life experiences are similar? How do we create places across the GLCA so that our campuses become model campuses for, for producing students who both know how to and have interest in embracing diversity because it's fun? Right? to meet people on your campus whose life experiences are different, to have the opportunity to become friends with people who see the world differently, who pray differently, who eat differently, um, is, is not just an incredible educational opportunity, it's just a fun way to spend time. Um, next, the curriculum, which is why we're doing this. I love the collaborations that have propped up over the last couple of years across our colleges, allowing us to leverage the time, talents, and passions of our faculty to bring more um, it, more conversations like this, not just in particular pockets on our campuses, but infusing it across the academic year, across the academic experience. This is incredibly, incredibly important. Um, one of the things I hear students say a lot is they want more intensive international experiences across their college career. And I actually think, I'm just gonna speak about Denison for a second, but I'm gonna guilt Kenyon by association. Again, we are very, very fortunate to be within a very quick drive of the people you're about to hear. And we just need to be doing more. Um, when, when, when students graduate from Kenyon and Denison and somebody says to them, oh yeah, aren't those schools near, near um, Columbus? Our students should be saying something more than, yeah, I, that's where the airport was, or I went to Easton once or twice during my career. Our students need to be able to talk about the internship they did in the Somali community, or the times they spent in and around Columbus engaging with refugees and migrants, learning, contributing, being challenged, and all those kinds of things. So I promised I would keep my remarks to, to 10 minutes. Let me end with just a um, kind of a, what I think is a, a, something I'm excited about. If you had been here yesterday or the day before, 
um, we had the presidents of the GLCA colleges here with the presidents of the Global Liberal Arts Alliance. So all of our colleges now have sister colleges in 17 countries around the world. They're all liberal arts colleges. They include an all women's college in Saudi Arabia, a really interesting college in Ghana, Hong Kong, Japan, Morocco, the list goes on and on and on. I think between what Columbus has to offer through these organizations and many more and the GLAA, we have an opportunity over the course of the next few years to weave the global, both domestic global and beyond, throughout the curriculum and co-curriculum on our campuses in ways that will not only um, enrich in the educational experience of our own students, but perhaps um, be create a new model for how liberal arts colleges do this right as we enter what is likely to be a very different political moment, um, and not just our own nation's history, but, but beyond. So, Thanks for letting me speak for a few minutes on a Friday afternoon. Um, I hope this is a really fun experience. Um, and for all the students who are participating, thanks for doing this. Last, just kind of shout out, that's not a presidential term. Um, thanks to the faculty who, who put this on. Um, I hope the students in the room realize how fortunate you are to go to a college where the faculty aren't just talented, but care so much about your academic experience. So thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Weinberg. So, um, you know, I have a very easy job. I'm a moderator, so it, it'll help um, in a lot of ways. So let me briefly talk about how the format's going to work. Uh, then I'll make a couple of remarks, uh, and then we can sort of start the conversation. Um, so first, what I will do is I'll just speak, the, uh, speak for a few minutes about the context we're in, uh, and uh, particularly around issues of uh, immigration, and the current politics, right? So um, I was going to say something, then two days ago the election happened, now I have to change what I have to say. Um, so then I think the most important part is, is after my talk, we'll talk about the, the history of the migration, right? I think that's really, really important in a way that uh, people migrate into the U.S. in a very different historical time, very different conditions, uh, and our panelists will talk about that in terms of what is the sort of the specificity of their migration, what is the politics, what is the economy of it. I think that's really, really important in a way that uh, a lot of times the migration, you know, it's, it's connected to humanitarianism or war uh, and, and sort of the labor issues that are very, very important in understanding education and, and issues of race and gender and everything else. Um, so then, uh, and I think that's what um, the main top topic we'll talk about is, is issues of education in terms of uh, what is the access, where do go stu uh, students go to school, what is the relationship between parents and students? Uh, what are some of the challenges? What is working, right? What is not working? Uh, what is childhood like for Somali students? What is the childhood like for uh, Bhutanese Nepali students? What, is, what does it be mean to be a youth, right? Living in urban areas, reimagining urban space in a, in a lot of different ways. So, so that's the topic we're gonna talk about. Um, I wanted to, whenever I teach a class in, in a very similar topic that professor is teaching here, I help students understand, or I try to, what is the difference between immigrant migration into the U.S. and perhaps a refugee migration, right? The immigrant migration is very complicated. It's very diverse. Historically, it's very complicated. Um, and, and I think a lot of scholars have talked about that. Um, at least in my experience, I came as an immigrant when I was 18 years old. Uh, I came here with a dream, right? I didn't have to take care of my parents. Uh, I didn't have to worry about anything else. My trajectory was work, go do well in schools, uh, go to college, do well, right? So it's a very much a sort of new liberal sort of a concept of migration. But if you think about uh, refugee migration is very, very complicated, right? The young people that I work with, they're thinking, is, they're thinking about education, but their main priority is really taking care of their family, right? So this starts early, early, very in 12, 12 years old, 13 years old. I hear so many high school students telling me, uh, Dr. Suwiti, should I really be going to school because my parents can't find a job? Uh, I need to go to work. So these are 13, 14 year old kids. So if you think about these sort of uh, stories, uh, they're very complicated stories about uh, what it means to be a non-immigrant, right? Uh, and trying to uh, rethink what it means to be a young person or uh, trying to achieve higher education. So if you think about a couple of other issues I wanted to talk about is um, in many of our communities, and I think it might be your case too, is that we have gotten a lot of calls within the last day or so. Um, what does this mean for my husband who is across the border? Uh, what happens to my sister who lives in Nepal? Will she be able to come? 
So this politics is, is a very uh, trying time for a lot of communities to think about uh, issues, right? So it's a lot of political rhetoric. Uh, and I just watched a video today in a cafeteria in Michigan. Uh, a lot of middle school students were yelling, build the wall, build the wall. There were a lot of Latino students in the room. So what does that really mean, right? So wall is not only a physical space, uh, but it also is a mental, mel mental one, psychological one, right? So in a way that it's a sort of the politics is a very important part of it. Um, and I also think about, um, and I study um, s the northern part of Columbus. I study um, the community that I, I connect with in a lot of ways. Uh, and I'm looking into how urban spaces are changing, especially how uh, youth are changing urban spaces. Uh, I have lived in Columbus since 2002, and that area, northern part of Columbus, has radically changed, right? Sort of Somali influences, now Bhutanese, Nepali influences, and so it is a sort of a different kind of imagining of urban space. Um, so before we go into the education part, I wanted to see if uh, Jabril or um, Lakshmi or Sudarshan would help us understand how the migration has taken place uh, within the last two decades or three decades might be. Uh, what might be the reasons behind it, and, and help us understand that issue. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for, to the organizers and to the panel, uh, to the uh, moderator and the three colleges that are taking part in this. Um, it's an, a, 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 an exciting topic to discuss refugees and immigration and education in the context of Columbus, Ohio. I will give, okay, all right. So I will discuss a general frame of the Somali migration, and then I will give personal examples from myself so that you understand how this all works. Um, so Somalis started coming to Columbus as early as the 1960s on scholarships and education and, and, and other things, not as refugees. They would come to the uh, University of Cincinnati, the Ohio State, other universities to study different fields. There are Somali lawyers uh, who studied at the OSU. There are, I mean, so I have friends who have been here since 1960 who are still in Columbus. Uh, some who are here in the since the 1980s who went to the Ohio University in Athens. So mostly it was educational uh, exploration that brought them here. And Somalia was at peace in those years until 1991 when the government collapsed. And there was civil war in the country. There was no institution, there was no police, there was no military, there was nothing. It was all civilians fighting civilians on the basis of lineage and clan. And Somalia has been the only country in this world that had no government for the past 20 years or so, until 2010 or so, there was no solid, even right now there's no solid government. It's actually a government supported by the world. It's, it doesn't control much of the country. So what happened? Conflict and people, that's a push factor. It, it pushes people away from their settlements, from their, their places where they lived. And many Somalis left Somalia. Uh, so Somalia is located in the eastern Horn of Africa, and on the other side of the Red Sea is Yemen. Many Somalis crossed the sea to go to Yemen, became refugees there. Many others crossed the border to Ethiopia. Many more went to Kenya. And in all of those places, some Somalis found opportunities through resettlement to Europe, Australia, and the United States. The United States government decided to resettle Somali refugees in two categories. Uh, one is the refugee resettlement program, which allocates individuals to the rest of the world, brings people from the rest of the world based on their need for protection, their fear of persecution, and many Somalis came in that way. Also groups, for example, the Somali Bantu community was brought in, and many of them live in the west side of Columbus, because they are Somalis but they are Somalis who are different than the other Somalis in terms of their looks, in terms of their traditions, in terms of their way of life. And it was really difficult for them to go back to Somalia, and there was no life for them in Kenya. So the U.S. government decided to resettle about 6,000 of them and distribute them across the United States. So that, those were the push factors. Now, 
there were also pull factors in some to some places. Columbus has the second largest Somali population in the U.S. The first is in uh, Minnesota, and Minnesota had a more established community already, so people went there a lot more. But in Columbus, people came because of the lower cost of housing, the lower cost of life in general. A gallon of milk in Columbus is something like less than $3. In some places, it's $5. So uh, Somalis being people with many kids, large families, life was cheaper in Columbus. And then it was also a place where you could easily find jobs. When I came to Columbus in 2005 uh, from Kenya, I remember the day I got my social security card on October, October 14th, 2005. The same day, my cousin took me to a job fair, and I was hired, and I started working the next day. So you don't find that kind of opportunity in many places, and that was another factor. And then the uh, existence of religious centers and community resources and other things was also very helpful. Now, so how does the resettlement process work? Now, uh, let me, so there is a 45,000 to 50,000 Somalis in Columbus right now, um, they are, getting established in terms of all aspects of life. They are, you know, graduating from schools and colleges. Uh, they are attaining degrees. They are working in professional jobs. They are running more than 500 businesses in Columbus. Um, it's a, a really growing community. Many of them have become citizens, and they have a, a voice at the ballot as well. So it's a significant community. In the school systems in Columbus, Actually, Columbus City Schools reports that Somali is the no number one non-English language spoken at home. So it's, it's, there is a higher number of Somali students in Columbus than any other ethnic group. The Nepali Bhutanese community is growing. It has uh, come up in the, uh, in the last five, six years. It has really grown significantly for the past several years. And so there is a significant community there. Now, Somalis face some challenges. I, you can see I'm black, I am Muslim, I am an immigrant, you know, in a, in a country where immigra immigrants who are Christians are afraid. What do you think of an immigrant who is a Muslim, who is also black? That is why we're receiving too many calls these days from uh, all kinds of people. And actually on my way here, I got a phone call from a cousin of mine who moved away from another state. She came to Columbus, she lives in Columbus with her eight kids now. And she said, Jibril, I applied for citizenship, for naturalization in my other state. And I moved before I was given the appointment for an interview or something. And I'm told that there is an interview waiting for me over there and I can't go back, what do I do? And if I cancel that appointment, what would happen to me if Trump becomes president before I get my next appointment? It is a, a you know, question of somebody's you know, future hanging in the balance. And, and would she drive or fly to the other state to do the interview? Would she report her change of address and wait for another appointment to come to Columbus? What, what, what's, what are her options? So uh, that is generally the way Somalis are right now. Uh, unlike in Minneapolis where there are many cases of uh, young people who are recruited into Al-Shabaab and other terrorist groups, Columbus has been relatively safe and, and for young people, young Somalis. Uh, there are many factors for that because the Somali community in here is very, um, is in a way better organized. It's more conservative in terms of a, a of its uh, preservation of its culture. There are, there are social pressures that stop you from doing whatever you want. In Minneapolis, you find young Somali Muslim girls with no headscarves, many of them. In Columbus, there's a friend of mine who is also a friend of Dr. Waters back there, uh, Awa. She's a professor at the University of Minnesota. She came to conduct research here in Columbus. And we were going together, the two of us. She goes without the scarf in Minneapolis. She's fine, nobody talks to her, nobody bothers her dresses and things. And we were going into Global Mall, one of the Somali-owned malls there. And she doesn't have a scarf. And there are not many Somali women with no scarves in Columbus. 
And this old man comes and he knows me and he says, Jibril, the young lady left her scarf in your car. <laughs> Just to remind her that she needs to cover up. She, he's pressuring her. <laughs> and we went inside and another woman who is a teacher comes by and we say hi and she says, who is this lady? And I say, she's Professor Ao. She says, okay. She looks at her. She's wearing black clothing. She goes back and buys a scarf and gives it to her. <laughs> so there are social pressures <laughs> that still exist in Columbus that stop young people from behaving in certain ways. Now, about the immigration experience and about the importance of uh, education, I was born in Somalia. And when I was born in Somalia, Somalia was a, basically, uh, it had practiced what's known as the scientific socialism. The government owned most things. All schools were free up to university level. You go to law school, you pay nothing, no debt. You go to the College of Education, you teach and you get paid and you pay nothing. And so it was free, healthcare was free, almost everything was free. And there was a huge military, there was a, a so the government was the main driver of the economy when I was growing up. There was peace, there was stability, I um, have had no worries for my life or for anybody else's life. I never thought I would leave Somalia, or Mogadishu, the city th where I was born. My dream was to, you know, finish uh, high school, finish college. Uh, maybe I would have finished college in 98 or 97, something like that, and I would have gone to work for three or so years. And in my, those uh, Somali hearsays, the world would have come to an end by 2000 the millennium. So uh, in 1991, the world actually came to an end for me. There was conflict, neighbors were fighting neighbors, friends were divided into clans, everybody was running away from everybody. And I had to run away, I had to leave Somalia, come to a place where I did not know, cross the Kenyan border, become a refugee, spend 10 years in a refugee camp where there's no hope. It's, it's, you can't go into Kenya, you can't go back to Somalia, you're in there. I was lucky because when I came, I was in the ninth grade. I got a school that started that year. It was a vocational school and you were given some options. You could study a, your high school subjects with some vocational skills, agriculture, carpentry, uh, accounting, so I went for the accounting option. And I finished my high school there, and I became a teacher in the refugee camp. But there is nothing, nowhere else to go. I, s I was teaching there for many years. My classes were not like this. I had a class, I remember, of third grade students, of 320 students. And there's no classroom, under a tree. The student in the back cannot hear me, and I am, I, I, I'm not very loud anyway. So um, it was a tough thing. While there, I started writing letters to companies and organizations that provide scholarships to people. And nobody has ever gotten a scholarship out of the refugee camps. And I was lucky to be invited for an interview to Nairobi for a scholarship. I came, the first question I was asked was, okay, Somalis. We had two Somali students and both of them did not finish their school. We spent a lot of money on them. How do we trust you? And I said I was in the refugee camps for many years. I have been either in the school or I have been working in the camps. I have never missed work for a day. I have nowhere else to go. If I knew where to go, if education is not my future, I wouldn't have applied for anything. And they tried me and I did my bachelor's degree in economics at the University of Nairobi. I got L all A's every day. Every single day, I was always on the honors, on the honors roll. Now, that organization is now sponsoring education in the refugee camps. I was in Nairobi last, uh, this, this August, and I visited them. They are managing the education in the camps. They are sponsoring over 100 students in Kenya. They have sent many others to Western universities to get an education. So it is 
education is the way out for a refugee young person. Here in Columbus, there are many challenges. There was a very high dropout rate in Columbus amongst Somalis, and we as a community came together. The organization that I had, Somalica, and does an annual celebration and a scholarship dinner for all Somali high school graduates, and Denison University is one of the sponsors of that program. And it's, uh, it's going very well. There are issues in education that we see that we deal with all the time, but the hope is very high. We're doing very good. The community is growing. It's, it's thriving. Thank you. Thank you. Um, with the interest of time, um, so that somebody, would you mind talking about the history of migration uh, from Bhutanese Nepali communities here, and then maybe Lakshmi Vaini, if you want to talk about a little bit about the education part. So, oh, thank you for this opportunity to talk here today. Uh, thank you, Dr. Shizuki, for providing this opportunity. Um, I come from the Bhutanese Nepali community, and I'm very fortunate that we have two titles, two nations, Bhutanese Nepali. And it also gives a background that uh, we are ethnic Nepali and we used to be in the southern part of Bhutan. Uh, for, uh, we moved to Bhutan, uh, not like uh, you know, Europeans moving to America, but we, it was a slow progressive migration, economic migration towards Bhutan uh, during the 18th century. And then uh, our, our parents, let's say parents, spent around 200 years in Bhutan. So to make this long story short, um, and during the 80s, Bhutan started a policy called One Nation, One People. So the policy was everybody need to look uh, in a similar way, and they need to put similar dress, and have to have a similar culture, similar religion. So one nation, one people policy uh, undermined the diversity of the uh, small nation. And the people in the south, uh, Nepalese were practicing Hinduism for a long time, and the people in the north, uh, the ruling class, were practicing Buddhism. And that began the ethnic cleansing in 90s. Uh, Bhutan is a tiny little country. Uh, I should have given you a background. It's between uh, India and China, two big nations. Uh, we call uh, the sandwich between China and India. So just like Nepal, if you see it right next to Nepal, it is there. And then during the early 90s, we began to move towards the camp because of the ethnic cleansing policy in Bhutan. Um, we spent around 18 years in camp, in an average, but the people who are coming right now have spent more than 24 uh, years in camp. So in the beginning, people were uh, randomly sent to different states and different cities uh, in the United States. But there are seven, seven other countries that accepted Bhutanese refugee to come uh, to be resettled. Uh, and the United States accepted the highest number, the largest bulk of refugees came to the United States. I think it is 84,000. So there were, uh, there were only over 100,000 100, Bhutanese refugees in a camp. And then uh, when people first came to the United States, they were resettled into different states, as I told you. And then uh, in the next few years, people began to move towards Columbus. Um, as Gabriel told that Columbus has a uh, certain factor, like is immigrant friendly and e easy to find job. And there are other factors like you are an uh, extended family member moving to Columbus. So this motivates people to come. And you know, it's, a, it's still a new community, and uh, we don't know a lot. And if my uncle is in a, a better job. He speaks English well. And then the other family member would follow, thinking that he will help or she will help, somebody would help. So that also motivates a lot of people to move towards Columbus. And now Columbus is uh, one of the largest concentration of Bhutanese Nepali here. The estimated population is around 18 to 20,000, but uh, just estimated only, I think, in since 2020 would be able to know what is the exact number. Um, we have some challenges because as a new community, uh, all communities have challenges. Uh, one of the big challenges due to the language barrier. Only the first generation Bhutanese know how to speak English well, but the, like my parents cannot speak English and most of their generation cannot speak English. And if you don't have l English skill, and if you don't have a skill set, it's very hard to find job, or you know you have very limited choice. These are the challenges. But at the same time, the uh, Bhutanese community is considered one of the uh, very thriving community, very vibrant community. Um, uh, in the last five years, it is estimated over 400 Bhutanese families have brought homes, and there are 20 independent businesses around most road area. Uh, there are. There are challenges at the same time, it is progressively doing very well. Um, but the 
you know, some of the challenges that I would like to share with uh, you is uh, challenges with the mental health. Uh, because people have spent years in camp, and then they were kicked out of their country, and people came to the United States with already having PTSD, and then when they come here, it's kind of cultural shock. They, they don't know how to navigate system, and things like this make them very difficult here. Um, and domestic violence is also another issue in Bhutanese community. Uh, and then, you know, our young generation, especially high school going students, have certain challenges. Despite the fact that Bhutanese students are doing well um, in a relative sense, because uh, we have a student organization now at Ohio State University. We call it a BAS, so Bhutanese American Student Organization. There are over 20 students. Um, and there are over 250 students at the Columbus State Community College. But the community is kind of, because of language and other challenges, community is getting divided into two phases. Like the families who are getting successful, who have educational background, and the families uh, who do not have educational background and just, you know, um, they are left behind. So this is a, in a quick summary kind of uh, phase of migration, how we move from Bhutan, and then spending years in camp. Although camp, you know, I don't have to explain much about the camp, but the good thing in the camp was education was provided at, at least at the cheaper rate also. So the first, uh, the second generation, I would say the 1.5 generation Bhutanese do have the education, the modern education system experience, and they can speak English well. Um, I think this is a pretty quick summary. Thank you. Uh, Lakshmi, would you be able to talk about the, your experience with education perhaps, or uh, connected to it? First of all, thank you all for having me here. I feel like I to do this. <laughs> My voice is can you hear? Can you hear in the back? Or can you hear me? Mike, Mike would be helpful, Bainey. Okay. <laughs> First of all, thank you all for having me, having us here. Well, uh, we, c me, I mean, like I came from Nepal and I spent 13 years of my life in there in a refugee camp, and it was not easy. But the best part about it is, as he mentioned, we had a free education. And um, to come here and then start our education is one of the plus, I would say. And um, we spend our whole day in a classroom full of like 60, 70 people. And when we come here, it's like different. We only have about like 20, 25 people in a classroom. So that's another plus. Um, <laughs> and I think. You, and you came to Kansas. Oh, yeah. Um, I came to Kansas City first from Nepal, and I stayed there for like five years, and recently moved here like two years ago. And I definitely continue my education and, um, and work as well. I work as, at a Fort Hayes Career Center that's a part of Columbus City School District, and I, do, I help ESL students there. Mm -hmm. and I think that's about yeah. it. Thank you. So uh, uh, thank you very much for providing the sort of historical context, right, of uh, arrival here. So I, as we had talked about uh, in our previous conversation, if you would help us understand, uh, and I think all of you alluded to this, but in terms of what are some of the issues related to education, right, the connections perhaps or the disconnections between parents and students, what is working in high schools, what is not working in high school perhaps, or what is working in higher education, right, the access is an issue that Dr. Weinbart talked about as well. So I think in all of our communities, perhaps, the access is an issue that, that we're really trying hard to get uh, students into Denison, um, you know, Ohio State, and, and other campuses. And the high school is also a really important for a lot of communities that some students are dropping out and some are not. Uh, so if you would help us understand, you know, what is from your own experiences working with youth, and so what, is, what might be some of the challenges, what might be the parents thinking about, what the communities might be thinking about, uh, or what the youth might be thinking about, so. Uh, sure, so uh, one issue that we notice in the Somali community, for example, is that many of the young people who come to the U.S. Uh, have had no, for example, who have had no prior formal schooling come here and they are placed at a grade level based on their age. So somebody is 16, they go to high school, they have never been to elementary school. They have 12 years of work or 11 years of work to do within a year or two. So, and they don't speak the language, they don't have the academic skills, they don't have the 
expectation they don't know what the expectations are they it is really difficult for those kinds of uh, young people those are some challenges we see what uh, the other thing is is that when i was growing up i remember my uh, father going to my school three times and he was one of the most involved parents <laughs> in the school systems Actually, one time, I think there was a complaint about me doing something. Uh, and he had to come and, and, and talk to the principal. And one time, he just came to check on me. It was a while later to, to see how pro my, my progress and everything was. And yeah, and I think the, the other time was when he was enrolling me in there, when I was five years old or something. So in the US, that's not true. I'm at my child's school every day and I am um, seeing his teacher several times a week just to say hi how are things going now uh, so parental involvement was not a big thing in Somalia education was communal everybody owned education everybody my neighbors my uncles my aunts knew about my academic performance if I did very well this time they would all congratulate me if I did very badly, everybody would fight me. <laughs> that was the way. And, and my information was public. But there was no connection between the parent, the individual cousin, the uncle, and the school. So one thing that Somalikan has done is to bridge that gap, to get into the schools, talk to the teachers, provide cultural competence. We see things like teacher, I, I was doing a cultural presentation for teachers. and. One teacher said, you know, I have this parent who is really involved. He's nice. His kid is good. But the problem is he wouldn't shake my hand. I extended my hand. He said no. And I really felt offended. And I feel not so comfortable talking to him anymore. <laughs> and it's a cultural thing. It's not to insult you, to make you feel bad. It's on religious grounds, on cultural grounds. So understanding that dynamic would be helpful. I mean, so here in America, there are things that you take for granted that people think are the right things. For example, when we say weekends, that's Saturday, Sunday. That was not my weekend. That's the Christian weekend. That's the Jewish weekend. My weekend is on Friday, right? So Thursday and Friday were my weekends. My week started, my first day of the school week was on Saturday. So I was scared of Saturdays like you're scared of Mondays. <laughs> now, the, 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 the concept of time, for example. When my aunt is here, she doesn't understand the American timing system at all. When she talks to me and she looks at the watch right now, what time is it? So 4.47, 5 o'clock. She wouldn't understand what that means. What she understands is that her day has 12 hours, and her night has 12 hours. Her 12 hours of the day begin at 6 a.m. Seven is hour number one. Eight, hour number two. Nine, hour number three. 10, four. 11, five. 12, six. One, why are we going down? <laughs> <laughs> I came, I left my home this morning at eight o'clock. And right now, it's 5 o'clock. Why am I going back? <laughs> Which one is bigger, 8 and 5? <laughs> it makes no sense to her. So you might be taking things for granted, but they are not seriously the things that people know. People know something else. So 12 hours of day, 12 hours of night. You have 12 hours that consist of half day, half night, and half day, half night in here. That's not the way it works for them. So. You know, one time I had a police officer. I, I was, uh, you know, I was involved in an accident. And a police officer came, and he asked for my license. And then he didn't ask me who was with me. My wife and my two children were with me. And the police report comes in the mail, and I look at it, and it says, Jibril Mohammed. He asked me for my wife's first name, which I gave him, Sarah Mohammed, and my son's names, and I gave him the names. So all of us, he gave us the last name, Muhammad. That's my last name. That's not my children's last name. 
That's not my wife's last name. But he made an assumption. This is the Muhammad family, this is his family. That's not the way it works. The way it works is that I have my name. I have my, my father's name as my middle name. I have my grandfather's name as my last name. Now my son has his name. I am his middle name. My father, who is my middle name, is my child's last name. You see how it works? My wife gets the same thing. She has her father and her grandfather, who is not my grandfather anyway. So she doesn't have my last name. She never gets my last name. She never assumes it. So making assumptions about you know, people who are new to you and thinking that what you know is the right thing is, is a problem. That's one of the challenges we have. So there are challenges at the community level. There are challenges at the school level. One issue that I want to point out, uh, and I think uh, you will be able to talk about it a little more, is Columbus has, a, has had a policy that became increasingly problematic for refugee communities. That was anybody that has English language issues would be placed at the Columbus Global Academy. And the school became so big that it became the largest <laughs> single school in Columbus. And I took upon myself to organize the people and fight against that. This was segregation. How do you take my kid to a school where nobody speaks English and say that's a normal school? It's not. You can't keep my child there. You, wanna, you want it to be a normal school, bring your child here. No, I will not bring it. Okay, then okay, allow my kid to live here as soon as they muster some English and have some basic understanding of the academic system. So, and there was a fight. We, we had to complain. We had to go to the school board. We had to do things. But then we, we had to go to the Ohio Department of Education, but we won. And, and right now, the school has been reduced in size, and, and people are allowed to have options. Yes. Thank you very much for that. I think that's the part that I think Sudarsan and all of us are very involved in that school that you mentioned. And it's, you know, that the isolation part, the racial isolation, you, you thought you're going to go to that school for only one year to improve English, right? You end up going there for three or four years. So it's just a cycle that just created a lot of problems for a lot of students. So, uh, Sudarsan, Lakshmi, would you want to talk about in some of the challenges that you may have seen firsthand working with youth in schools and so? So uh, Lakshmi would be able to add some details on it because he's working on Columbus Public School as an assistant teacher or ESL teacher. Um, I work as a community center, as Dr. Shubedi mentioned, and uh, we have to work with some of the challenges that our parents face in a day-to-day -day basis. And uh, what I have experienced uh, is um, the language barrier, language barrier with the parents. When the school wants to communicate with parents, they send a letter or they make a phone call and parents cannot understand and sometimes, you know, if that is a letter, the kids may not be helping their parents to translate that. Uh, if, you know, that may go against them. So language barrier. And the other challenge is having difficulty navigating the system because it is an uh, entirely different system than they used to back home, especially for parents and even for the kids the, to navigate system. And um, there is a challenge with the high school dropouts. Um, as Dr. Shubedi mentioned in the beginning, the, the challenges with the high school dropout is economic reason. Uh, you know, parents may not be making enough money to pay their bills, and then kids may have to s help their parents. Um, there are substance abuse issues also. Teenagers getting caught into that, uh, uh, you know. It, so these are there are some issues like, um, and then. The, the other reason that parents cannot understand the system here is teachers had a different role back home. Teachers had more authority and more right over the students. And then still parents ex expect the same authority. They say that, why don't my teacher control my kids? I have sent my kids to school and they need to take care of the kids. But here, so they have a hard time understanding uh, here it is a different system. And uh, as Gabriel was talking about, there's a cultural difference in understanding in education. So because of the cultural difference, you know, it takes a lot of time, a lot of understanding to actually understand a different culture. And so that makes parents, as well as the high school going kids, difficult to understand what education system works or how education system works here. Um, yeah, I think Lakshmi will add some details into it. 
Um, just a quick thing to add into the Global Academy School. It's uh, now they change something about it. It used to be um, everybody who came into the country and they take a te um, placement test would go in there, but now um, student who l recently come to US and only lived here for like less than a year are recommended to go there. And But they do have an option not to go there if they do fine on the test. And that's one thing. And another thing about like high school dropout as you mentioned, I r totally agree with like being probably like the oldest or oldest in a family or also um, the one who speak a little English and the parents rely on them too much because since they don't know anything, they rely on them and they think a little education is enough, but they don't think about like how the future hold for them in like a couple years or so, like when they start having their own family and stuff. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to share a quick story, then we will open up for a conversation, is that uh, I was visiting a family, but this Nepali family about a year ago, um, and they have two kids. One is 12 years old, the other one is nine years old. Uh, and the parents are young, perhaps in the early 40s, that may not be young to you, um, but uh, in a way that they, they could not read uh, or write in Nepali or in English, right? So there's a phone call came in, then the 12-year-old girl answered the phone, and I had a half an hour conversation with a hospital nurse. She, whole time she performed as a mother. And, and I was just like, wow. So you could see that, you know, the kind of responsibilities these youth have in Somali communities and Buddhist Somali communities is incredible. I have a 12 year old child who speaks English, but other than that, she doesn't have any responsibility, right? So the, the role, if you think about it, for youth uh, who come from communities like this is incredible. They're taking incredible, they're not thinking about going out and having a fun on Friday night. Their job is to translate for their parents. So I was stunned by that whole thing that, you know, she just pretended. And I said, do you do that all the time? She said, you know, whenever I do have to do with the rent issues, medical issues, writing bills, 12-year-old, I was like, oh, my goodness. You know, this is something that, uh, that I think our youth have an incredible burden in terms of thinking through this. And they took it in a very... In a very, they had a lot of pride that they did this too. So, so we wanted to, we have about maybe nine, 10 minutes. We wanted to open up for conversation. Questions you may have, comments you may have, uh, or, or some direction that you'd like to go to. So, Sorry. go ahead. Yeah, so I was saying Ohio State has a uh, Somali 1101, an, an elementary Somali language and culture course, fully online. And you can take it from anywhere. People from the UK are taking the class, people from California, people from elsewhere. So, and I'm teaching it, so, yeah. Hi, my name is Medina. Um, so, being an Afghan American refugee, I related to a lot of experiences that um, children have when they come to or migrate to America. Um, you guys spoke about like the barriers between like children and their parents and that responsibility of translating. I was wondering if there's any efforts um, towards integrating parents and having these ESL classes for parents to integrate into their community. Um, so. Yeah, um, so I'll try to answer this. In a <laughs> We do have that. We do parents' school engagement. Um, we take parents uh, in those meetings, and then our translator would go and explain to them. Uh, we do have ESL classes, and then we do often community meeting where we bring parents and uh, school administration together and try to explain to them. Did I answer your question? Okay. Their, um, 
Yeah, yeah there's some really great questions, but we don't have that right now. Yeah. Okay, so there are um, English language classes available in many parts of the immigrant communities areas. And actually, the Franklin County uh, Job and Family Services that provides welfare and assistance to refugees and families mandates every parent, every adult in the, f in the household, if they have no job, to study, to learn English. Now, there are resources that exist. For example, Somalican, in collaboration with the Columbus Public Health, has a program for younger, uh, for parents of younger kids. Um, it's called Celebrate One. There is a very high, say, infant mortality rate in Franklin County amongst blacks and immigrants and, and different communities. And we have people called connectors. What they do is they reach out to people and we have someone from the Nepali Bhutanese community, we have someone from the African American community, we have a couple of people from the Somali community. What they do is they reach out to people and they talk to them about resources that are available. So that the person, if they run out of food, knows where to go for it. If they run out of formula, where to go for it. If they run out of diapers or other resources, that would be helpful for, for, for the family, how to seek those. And um, I don't know if there is something like this in Ohio because I'm kind of new, but then when we're in Kansas, we used to have this um, kind of like um, Saturday and Sunday, like weekend organization kind of thing. And what they do in there is help older people help to like learn, I mean like not really learn, but help them with the citizenship um, a answering question and, and stuff. And not just with like only a Nepali people, but they also had it for like Somali people and stuff. And but with the Nepali people, what they did was gather all the older folks and someone who speak English, like English is their native language, they used to like ask them questions and help them. And there was like few of the interpreters, I was one of them, and a couple others to help them translate in Nepali so they can better understand and stuff. Can I add something really quickly to what you said? So um, between 2008 and 2011, there were a lot more courses for adults in Ohio. Uh, parents were able to go to school for six months, even for one year, right? Then our governor changed the politics, right? So the idea was to come into the classroom, go to two, three months of schooling, then go back to work, right? So there is an incredible push to go towards work rather than be educated so that education would be lifelong, right? So that was taken away and it has created a lot of problems for adults members of the community because they are not being formally educated in these, particularly on the English language, how to speak, how to talk, how to read the bills, right? That are really, really important part of it, so. Comment to what Madina said. I went to school in Columbus City Schools, and um, I know that my school had um, a program for uh, immigrant families. So they would just come in if their kids if, um, are enrolled in um, one of the Columbus City Schools. They'll go to through my school because I went to. I don't know if you guys know of it, Global they Academy. Closed, yeah, yeah, they closed it. It's now in. Um, yeah, they reopened they it. They reopened uh -huh. it, right? So uh, my class was the last graduate there, but now they also have a small program for the families. They can go there for half a day. So there is that. Yeah. Is that for like adult education? Adult education. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, in the last uh, 15 and 20 years, I've had a lot of my family migrate uh, to the states from Syria. And they've all insisted, even though they didn't necessarily have the financial means of sending their kids to private schools, do you see a lot of that in the Columbus community? And is there, I guess, any assistance for people that would want to send their kids to private schools? So, um, private school is a very new thing to our community, and I don't think there are any families who could afford to send their kids to private school. But what is happening today uh, in Bhutanese community is parents are moving towards uh, school districts that have higher ratings instead of staying in Columbus uh, City School. Columbus City School has a very, uh, you know, not good rating, and then who, 
who knew that you know education matters and then school district matters people are moving towards like black league or reynoldsburg or westerville so uh, that's the one push but no private schools yet but, um, i do know a family who used to go to columbus city school district and now uh, i think the church or like probably one of their teacher recommend them to go to the private school and he is in private school and he's not even paying a penny for it and i don't know probably the school or the church is helping them or not so there are options available uh, in the somali community we see a lot of charity schools some of them run by somalis actually um, there is one private school that has a, an Islamic curriculum. I think it's called the Sunrise Academy. And what it does is it incorporates the academic standards here with Arabic and Islamic instruction. And many Somalis take their kids over there. It's in Iliad, Ohio. And um, there are other things that are coming up. I see lots of homeschooling and, and other things that are coming up as well these days. I wanted to say, um, I think th if you think about it, my own experiences and perhaps the panelists as well, private school is, is, is a big deal globally, right? The globalization of private schools, it's very expensive. Um, so our, in our community here, I think there are a lot of, lot, many, barely anybody goes to private school, maybe with ex some exceptions, but it's going towards charter schools. Charter schools are very controversial, very political. So a lot of the charter schools are, are coming to our neighborhood and saying, we are private school, come to our private school. And it really appeals to a lot of communities. And when they go in there, it's like it's not really private. It's something else very bizarre, right? So there is, so if you look at the private school conversation in, in Ohio, especially northern part of Columbus, more short area, it's very political. And many are not doing well. There are some doing well, but many are not. So. I'd like the conversation to keep going, but uh, uh, we have the time. And uh, just we, we need to take a five minutes break before the, uh, going to that, the student-oriented panel for the second half. But please uh, give our thanks to the four three panelists and the moderator. Thank you so much.